recording. So we've just kind of gotten a little bit of a start on chapter six, um, which is blood. And so we were talking about plasma, the components of blood. Um, and so we kind of spun down blood in the previous slide, we kind of took a look at some of the basic components um, of the blood itself. And so we're now talking about the things that are in plasma. And so in the plasma, you have what's called plasma proteins. So basically proteins that are um, floating around in the plasma itself. Make sure I took myself off mute here. Good. Okay. And so albumins are by far the most abundant of all the plasma proteins. And so they do a couple of things. For instance, they transport molecules, typically lipids, through your bloodstream. They also are the contributors of osmotic pressure in the capillaries. Uh, more so than others. So like when your blood gets pushed out of the capillary um, and it leaves behind all of the stuff that's too big to go through the capillary, one of those things is too big to go through the capillary, the plasma protein, in particular the albumins. Um, and so they kind of stay behind creating this sort of concentration um, effect. And so uh, another type of protein you see in plasma are the globulins. Uh, so these are also transport. They can also be um, immune uh, types of globulins as well. So there's different types of globulins. So these are your, what's called your immuno, that's an M, sorry, immunoglobulins, which are basically antibodies. So your antibodies are circulating, circulating through uh, your bloodstream and your plasma. And so this is basically how you have immunity. So for instance, if you don't know whether or not you have immunity to a particular uh, disease of some sort, then you can just do a blood test and they can check to check your antibodies to see if you've got um, uh, enough antibodies to fight off that particular um, that particular disease. Uh, fibrinogen is also another big one. So typically when you have this ogen suffix, it basically means it's an inactive form of whatever the protein name is in front of it. So for instance, fibrin is stored in an inactive form as fibrinogen. Um, and so when it's activated, you cut off that uh, piece of it and that activates it, turning it into fibrin, which is essentially one of the core pieces of blood clotting. And which makes a lot of sense, right? Because you don't want an active blood clotter in your blood because it's gonna basically turn your blood into sludge and you're gonna die, right? So basically it turns your blood into quick dry cement um, and then your heart can't pump that. And that's the reason why it's in an inactive form. Okay. So let's take a look at some of what we call the formed elements. So the formed elements are the cells, essentially that are in blood. And uh, in particular, what we wanna take a look at are the red blood cells. In chapter seven and eight, we take a look at the functionalities of the white blood cells. We'll take a look at those in more detail in seven and eight. But the red blood cells or erythrocytes, which we call them, are essentially a disc-like cell that has this kind of pucker in the middle and that's to increase your surface area. So literally they kind of look like a little disc with like a little bit of a divot in the middle of them to increase your surface area. And so this is kind of uh, unusual as far as cells are concerned. Um, as a cell type, um, it doesn't have a nucleus. So essentially it's full of the protein hemoglobin um, and it doesn't have like all the organelles of a cell because it gets rid of them. And so it's unusual in cells in your body because all your cells have your nucleus and all the other organelles that we talked about in cells earlier, uh, but they tend to be very abundant. So they're very, very specialized to do the job that they're designed to do, which is essentially to carry oxygen. And so the way that they do that um, is through the use of the protein hemoglobin. And so this is our pigment and it basically has four pieces to it and each of these individual pieces will bind to a molecule of glucose. And so once it's bound to that glucose, then it can transfer that oxygen, glucose, I keep saying glucose, oxygen. Once it binds to that oxygen, 
then is able to transfer that oxygen to the tissues who need that oxygen to do cellular respiration. And so the portion of the hemoglobin that actually does the binding is what's called the heme group. And it's, uh, this is basically what we refer to as a prosthetic group. So-called because it's not actually part of the protein. That's why I call it a prosthetic. Um, and so this is basically kind of a carbonaceous, sort of like a cage-like structure with an iron atom in the middle of it. And this iron atom is what will bind to the oxygen, but it also binds to carbon monoxide, which is the reason why. So carbon monoxide actually competes with oxygen for the heme. So that's the reason why carbon monoxide will kill you is because the carbon monoxide will bind to your heme groups instead of oxygen and it, you'll essentially, you'll asphyxiate basically. So you'll just, your blood will be binding this stuff. It'll be transporting directors, but it won't have any oxygen to deliver because it'll all be bound up with carbon monoxide and then essentially you'll just die of oxygen deprivation. And that's essentially what ends up happening. So when your hemoglobin is bound to oxygen, we refer to it as oxyhemoglobin or HBO. Um, and then when it's not bound, it's deoxyhemoglobin. So those are just two terms that we have for that. So these are actually my real micrographs. So this is a scanning electron micrograph of red blood cells in circulation. So you can see they kind of have this little kind of pucker in the middle of them that increases their surface area so you get better gas transfer. And then you can see here, this is actually a light micrograph. Of a capillary, which is basically a really, really thin cell. It's about the thickness of a, of a single red blood cell. So you can see how the red blood cells are basically kind of moving through this little capillary in single file. And that's to ensure you have good gas exchange. That's, that's why you have them going single file. So they're in contact with that. So here's what your hemoglobin looks like. So you can see you have basically four major subunits. So you have two of what's called the alpha globins. And then the purple ones are the beta globins. And so each of these guys by themselves are not sufficient to carry blood. But when they come together as a team, two alphas and two betas, then they're able to bind to oxygen and carry that throughout your blood cell. And then, of course, you can see in the middle of each of these, you'll see this kind of heme structure and that red ball is a ball of iron and the iron is actually what binds to oxygen. So you can see every hemoglobin has the capacity to bind up to four oxygens. And so that's how your oxygen is carried throughout your body. Now, what about carbon dioxide, right? Because blood doesn't just deliver oxygen. It also picks up waste, which in this case is carbon dioxide. So how about that one? Well, carbon dioxide basically will be transported in your bloodstream in one of three ways. So the first one is basically going to be dissolved directly into plasma. So this is just like a, like a two liter Coke, right? You know the carbon dioxide is in a two liter Coke. Why? Because when you pop the top, it fizzes, right? So that's basically gas that's been dissolved in the liquid coming out of solution because of change of pressure. And so at a very low level, CO2 will actually just dissolve into the plasma fluid by itself. It's usually less than 10% though. So it's not like the major strategy that you wanna use in, uh, to basically transport CO2 around. About a quarter of the time, you're going to be binding it to um, the globin protein piece of hemoglobin. Now CO2 does not compete with oxygen. It actually binds to the amino acid portion of hemoglobin. And when it does so, we call it carbamino hemoglobin. So that's basically bound off. So you can, so hemoglobin can carry an oxygen and a carbon dioxide at the same time. Okay. And then the third one, which is the bulk of the transports, most of it, over two thirds to three fourths of it is gonna be carried in our carbonate buffer system. So basically, if you take a carbon dioxide and add it to a water, it'll be converted into a carbonic acid, which will then dissociate into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. Now, these are basically reversible. 
So if you have a bunch of excess carbon, you can basically dump it into the system and you can basically carry it as part of your normal carbonate buffer system. Remember, this is the buffer system that's responsible for maintaining your physiological pH at about 7.4. And so that is basically how a lot of it is transported. Now, when you take a look at where these red blood cells come from, the red blood cells themselves are going to be um, originating from the red marrow, which is in your long bones. Now, as they're being developed, one of the things that red blood cells do that's odd is they kick out their nucleus and, of course, all the rest of the organelles as well. So if you don't have a nucleus, what that basically means is you kind of can't really live as a normal cell. It's like you need that nucleus to be able to do your normal business, to have a normal life. And so without that nucleus, basically, you can't live for very long. You're kind of just running on sort of fumes, if you will. And so that's the reason why the red blood cells will basically need to be recycled every 120 days or so. So typically three, four months, uh, you'll basically have to recycle or turn over your red blood cells. Typically speaking, when you have a red blood cell that's worn out, it's ready for recycling, it's going to be removed from circulation. Generally, that's going to be done by macrophages that are either in the liver or the spleen. Those are the two big locations for red blood cell recycling. And so um, they will be then sort of, how should I say, broken down. And then a lot of the byproducts of the red blood cells will just be turned over and used for making new red blood cells with. So you're basically recycling most of your red blood cells. Uh, there's also a couple of other things that they are involved in that are also important as well in your digestive system. But this is basically kind of the life of your red blood cell. You're born, you get rid of your brain, essentially, and then you just essentially sort of run on fumes for as long as you can until you crash, uh, basically. And so this is one of the reasons why, um, if you've ever worked with a diabetic or if you've been diabetic, one of the things that you oftentimes are keeping a close eye on is your glycemic index, and you're also looking typically at glucose management in your body. Um, it's a couple of things that oftentimes you're checking when you're a diabetic. Number one is obviously your blood glucose levels, right? And that's typically checked on a day-to-day -day basis to see whether or not you need to take insulin in order to manage that blood glucose to kind of keep it within norm. Um, but another thing that oftentimes you'll do if you are a diabetic is uh, when you go in to see the doctor routinely, is they'll oftentimes check your A1C. A1C is basically the amount of accumulated glucose that your um, red blood cells have interacted with. It's kind of a direct measure of how your historic blood glucose levels have been. Right? The idea is if you've got a very high A1C, it means that your blood cells have been living in and amongst high, very high glucose levels, which means you haven't been very well controlled over the last three or so months. And then that's one way that an endocrinologist or a doctor could take a look at your, your um, blood glucose management is by checking that A1C. Um, and of course, obviously the idea is the more glucose you eat, the more it basically is going to be giving you a positive A1C, right? So the higher your A1C means the more glucose you've been eating in the last three months or so. So it's kind of a bit more of a historical view, not necessarily what have you been eating in the last 24 hours, but more like, well, how's it been going in the last three months, right? Uh, and the, the reason why this is good is because um, we can be good for 24 hours and kind of fake our way through the tests to make sure that those numbers look good, right? It's like, I'm just not going to eat any sugar for like 48 hours. And then my blood glucose levels will look really good. And then I'll look like, you know, a good little boy. You're, you're doing a good job managing uh, but in reality, after the doctor's visit, I just go and binge on the bag of Oreos, right? So, so the A1C, you can't, you can't, um, you can't rig that one, right? Because it's taking everything you put in your mouth, everything that's in your body is going to register in the A1C, right? So you can't hide that one. You can't fast your way around that number. Um, it's a true reflection of just basically how good you've been. So you know, you come in with great glucose numbers, but then I check your A1C and it's a train wreck. And it's like, oh, 
So you haven't been as good as your glucose numbers are telling me that you've been doing. So what you need to do is you need to do whatever you've been doing for the last 24, 48 hours to basically pass this glucose test. And you need to do that like all the time. And then your A1C levels will come down. And then that historically, that means your, your body is managing your blood glucose levels well. So that's basically red blood cells. They're small and dish shaped so they can kind of fit and fold the way through these really tiny narrow capillaries and be able to have maximum gas exchange. The hormone that's responsible for red blood cell production is erythropoietin EPO. And so this basically is going to be produced by the kidneys, typically in response to um, oxygen levels that have been low. So you have low oxygen levels in your blood that will oftentimes stimulate EPO production. And this will kind of ramp up the bone marrow to start making red blood cells. Remember, we took a look at those stem cells earlier that were giving rise to those blood cells. And so EPO will stimulate those stem cells to make and to start producing more red blood cells um, so that you can start basically binding and delivering more oxygen. That's the idea, right? Upregulate that oxygen delivery. So that's kind of what it looks like. So you have low oxygen levels and then that's going to stimulate your kidneys to make erythropoietin, which will stimulate your red bone marrow and the stem cells in your red bone marrow to start making more red blood cells. And that'll start dumping new red blood cells into the bloodstream, which will give you more carrying capacity for oxygen, which means you're going to be able to actually bind to more oxygen that you're breathing and be able to get more of that oxygen that you're breathing in and be able to bring those levels back up. Okay. So you can see there is um, a lot of interaction and communication between your cardiovascular system and your urinary system, your excretory system. Right? Your kidneys have a lot to say about um, oxygen and also blood pressure. So some of the disorders associated with this, so you have the accumulation um, of heme in your blood, that's basically jaundice. And that's usually because your liver can't get rid of it. So this is usually due to some sort of liver damage. So your liver basically is not functioning um, normally and appropriately. And so what happens is that normal excretion of, of heme through the liver is backing up. And as it backs up in the liver, it starts to back up into the blood vessels that feed the liver. And that starts to go throughout your body. And as you get buildup of that heme byproduct um, in the rest of your bloodstream, it starts to turn your vasculature, this kind of yellow color. Um, this is where your skin starts to take on a yellowish color and your eyes, the whites of your eyes start to take on kind of a yellowish color. And this is because your normal hemoglobin, which is red, and that's the reason why we kind of have a flesh tone color, kind of almost a reddish hue uh, to our skin. Um, that's because of the hemoglobin, because it's red. But then when you fill your blood up with this yellowish heme byproduct, then that starts to take, their blood starts to turn kind of a yellowish color. And that's where we get that jaundice from. Anemia is simply when you have um, a loss or a reduction in red blood cells. And so you have too little hemoglobin to bind to the oxygen. This could be caused by several different things. One and a very common one is what's called iron deficiency anemia. This is essentially when you don't have enough dietary iron. Because remember, iron is the one that, made, that binds to the oxygen. Um, this is what you need to bind the oxygen. So if you don't have any iron in your system, then you're not going to be able to have the fundamental ability to bind to the oxygen. And so even though your red blood cells are there, the heme is not in and functional in those hemoglobin. So you're having a hard time binding oxygen. This is an easy one you can fix. You just basically take an iron supplement. Okay. Pernicious anemia oftentimes is associated with a lack of B12. And so B12 is actually uh, what creates or what makes the heme group. So the heme is actually a B12 derivative. That's the reason why you need B12 in your system is so that you can actually make these prosthetic groups. Um, and so if you don't have that, then you're not going to be, bind, be able to bind oxygen. If you get like a B12 shot and you kind of get that little boost in energy, um, it's not because the B12 is creating energy for you necessarily. What it's all doing is basically uh, filling out or topping off your tank, so to speak, to make sure that every heme group is 
maximally impacted in every hemoglobin. So every hemoglobin has a heme group in it. So it, it basically kind of maximizes your oxygen delivery capacity. That's the reason why you get a little bump up in energy. It's not because the B12 is energetic. It's because it's a necessary metabolite to fuel your energetic pathways, which are already humming along and they're just waiting for oxygen so that they can actually move along. Uh, folic acid is another one. That's another B complex um, vitamin. So you need folic acid to make some of your um, our red blood cells. Um, this is also a component of your heme group. So there's a couple of things that go into the heme uh, group as well, but you need folic acid. So oftentimes um, if you're deficient in folic acid, if you take a B complex supplement, or sometimes like when you're pregnant, you'll take a folic acid supplement. Um, and that's because uh, the mother is using a lot of up a lot of her folic acid to basically um, to develop and support the, the baby. And so she'll have to take some more in order to make sure she doesn't run low on folic acid. The hemolytic anemia. So this one is, so hemo basically refers to blood. Lytic means to cut. So this is blood cutting. So this is basically where you run into hemolysis or the rupturing of blood cells. So this is what would happen if you injected pure water into your veins. Uh, this is one of the reasons why when you go to the emergency room, they, they hook you up to fluids. But if you notice, if you look at the bottle, if you look at the, the bag closely, it's not pure water. Because if it was pure water, they'd be rupturing all your red blood cells and you'd be getting anemic, like almost very, very, very quickly. And that would be a very bad situation. So what it is, is basically a saline that matches the salinity of your plasma. That's the fluids that they're actually putting in there. And then we have a genetic version of anemia, sickle cell anemia. And this is a situation where you have a, a mutation in the beta globin protein that causes this sort of misshaped um, and mis, mis, uh, malformed structure of these globins. And so what this creates is a sickling of the cell. So you can see a sickled cell here. And so generally speaking, these sickled cells will become somewhat dysfunctional. So they're not gonna be able to function normally and not only that, but they're also prone to rupture. So you'll actually rupture them as well. Um, and so that's your sickle cell anemia. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the white blood cells. We'll kind of introduce the white blood cells here and we'll take a look more at the details of their functions in the next couple of chapters. So your white blood cells are normal cells. That is to say that they're large, typically uh, much larger than red blood cells. They have a nucleus. They didn't get rid of their nucleus. Uh, normally they're, you can see through them. They're translucent unless you stain them, but they're translucent um, and they're really, really tiny. They're like less than 0.1% of your overall formed elements. So you're talking about a very tiny number, right? A fraction of your formed elements. These guys are also gonna be produced in the red marrow and their hormones, like remember the hormone for red blood cells was EPO, erythropoietin. You also have hormones that are stimulating white blood cell production. In this case, we call them colony stimulating factors or CSFs. Now a colony stimulating factor, let me explain what that is. It sounds kind of a very technical term. It's a kind of a holdover term from research. So the way we studied cells and cell growth in particular was we did tissue culture, which means we took a group of cells in culture, like on a plate, an auger plate, and then we gave them various um, nutrients for them to grow. And they either grew or they didn't. Um, and we'd kind of make notes on the different types of things we would add to it that would cause them to grow. So certain chemicals we'd add to them would stunt their growth and certain chemicals we'd add to them would stimulate their growth. And so the group of molecules that would stimulate their growth, we termed colony stimulating factors. They actually turned out to be growth hormones, essentially what they turned out to be later on. We figured that out. But the name stuck, and so CSF it is. So Typically speaking, these white blood cells um, are infection fighters. So they're part of the immune system. So they're gonna go after pathogens and fight off infection. And uh, some of them, they're very short lived, even more so than the red blood cells. So you're talking about days maybe, um, some, especially if you're in an active infection and they're like in battle, um, as soon as they're made, they'll go to the point of the battle and then they'll just get killed right, in the battle. 
And so they live for a few days. Some will be patrolling your body routinely for months. Some will, can even last for years. It depends on the nature of those white blood cells. So here are the white blood cells we have. There's five primary types of white blood cells that we see. We can break them into two major groupings. And so the first group that we have here, these guys are what's called the granulocytes. So-called because they have granules, cytoplasmic granules. with different types of proteins in them, signaling proteins. And so we'll see these granules, they stain a uh, particular color. And so we have granulocytes in the second group, which is only two of them, are what's called the agranulocytes. These guys don't have the cytoplasmic granules. So first of all, when you take a look at them, you'll notice that in the granulocytes, uh, the first one that you're going to see are the neutrophils. So the neutrophils will have this kind of multi-lobed kind of nucleus. So you'll see that it kind of looks kind of weird and amorphous. And then it'll kind of have a little constriction point, a little big lobe here and a little constriction point, and then kind of this big lobe here. So it's a multi-lobed nucleus, and that's kind of typical of neutrophils. They'll also have these cytoplasmic granules in them that will have stain on them. But these guys typically are phagocytic. What that basically means is they engulf and eat pathogens. So bacteria. Eosinophils are also kind of multi-lobed. So typically they'll kind of have these little constrictions just like, you know, like when you're making like a little poodle out of a balloon. Um, so you kind of have those like little constriction points, those little thin points of a balloon. That's kind of like what these guys look like. Um, so they tend to have cytoplasmic granules that stain red. They look very red in nature. And so um, their granules will help to digest large pathogens, like for instance, worms. So these typically you'll see in more abundance with the parasitic infection. Sometimes allergies as well. Basophils are another type. Notice the same kind of a nucleus. You can see this little kind of lobe-like nucleus with this constriction point in between. However, the granules here stain more of a blue color. And so these guys will have granules, molecules in their granules that will be responsible for promoting blood flow, especially when you injure your tissues, they're also gonna be in charge of the inflammation response. And so that's what they're gonna be involved in. So those are your granulocytes. Your A granulocytes come in two different flavors. The first one are the lymphocytes. There's a couple of major types of lymphocytes called B and T cell lymphocytes. We're gonna take a look at each one of those individually, but you can see here, you have basically a clear cytoplasm. That's why they're called A granulocytes. There's no granules in that cytoplasm. And their nucleus tends to be large and uniform, very homogenous in nature. Okay. Now the next one also is monocytes. So they also have a fairly clear cytoplasm. Their nucleus is horseshoe shaped. But the thing to remember and to notice about this is notice there's no puckering. I don't know if that's a word, but there's no puckering of the nucleus. There's no balloon poodle effect, right? So you don't see those little constriction point, points in a, in a monocyte. Now, the important thing about a monocyte is these guys are also phagocytic, which means they're going to engulf and digest pathogens, but they also basically become macrophages. As a matter of fact, monocytes are essentially monocytes in your bloodstream. Once they exit the bloodstream, they become and transform into macrophages. So macrophages are essentially monocytes that have transformed into the macrophages. Okay. So 
So if you did a blood test, what you would see is monocytes. If you tested your tissues, what you would see are macrophages. Okay. So you have a couple of different phagocytic cells and uh, a bunch of other different types of cells. So basically your granulocytes, and this is kind of like a, a more of a organized blab slide of, of basically what we have on the previous slide. So you have your neutrophils, which are phagocytic, your eosinophils and your basophils, which are granulocytes. And then your agranular leukocytes are gonna be your lymphocytes and your monocytes. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at each one of them individually. So the neutrophils, first of all, these guys are gonna be the most abundant of all the white blood cells in your bloodstream. Now remember, your white blood cells overall as a group are only mustering up to about 0.1% of all your formed elements. So to say that white blood cells are the most abundant is still not a very, very big number by any stretch of the imagination. It varies depending on whether or not you're in an active in, uh, infection or not. Between um, 50 to almost three fourths of the overall white blood cell count. They tend to have these multi lobed nuclei, like I showed you on the actual micrograph images. Um, these guys are the first responders. They typically are the first ones to attack when you get a bacterial infection. They'll engulf the pathogens by phagocytosis and then they die. And so typically speaking, these neutrophils are patrolling. They will leave your bloodstream and they'll go into your tissues and kind of patrol around your tissue. Now, why is that a good idea? Well, think about it. Whenever you cut yourself, what's the first point of contact and access for a pathogen? Your skin layers, right? Number one. Number two, the connective tissue associated with your dermis. So in your connective tissue area, that is to say in your tissues, that's where you're going to have that first invasion, that first point of contact. This is where your pathogens are entering your body. So it makes a lot of sense to have these white blood cells out there patrolling around in case you happen to get a breach in your defenses. Okay. Now, the important thing about neutrophils is they kill like a bee. So they kill like a bee stings. How does a bee sting? Have you ever been stung by a bee? What happens to you? Yeah, it goes into the skin, right? Have you ever looked closely at what? So let me, before I get to that one, right? What happens to the bee after he stings you? Yeah, if you've ever followed him, I've done this before, right? I mean, the bee basically goes off and it doesn't last very long, right? Because, yeah, go ahead, Lizzie. Yeah, right? I mean, if you watch them closely, it's like they're almost like half of their abdomen gets torn off when they leave that stinger behind. And if you look closely and you kind of dissect it out a little bit, you can actually see that what happens is the bees have like a little poison sac in their abdomen that has its own musculature. And when the stinger gets embedded in your skin, they basically, that pulls their abdomen off, but the musculature of the stinger is left behind and you can actually see the poison sac still pumping, pumping poison into you while the bee's off with only half an abdomen dying. It's kind of like if somebody were basically to pull your entrails out, you're not gonna last very long, right? And so the bee dies. And then of course the stinger stays in our skin. So a neutrophil is like a bee. It kills once and then dies. And this is one of the reasons why in an active infection, oftentimes it gets pussy. The pus is actually leftover dead neutrophils. Essentially, you're looking at the battlefield with all of the dead bodies strewn all over the battlefield. In this case, the dead bodies of your neutrophils strewn all over the place. And that's what pus is. Okay. So they just sort of start things. But notice they're granulocytes though, right? So what happens when a neutrophil kills? It doesn't kill like a honeybee. Like those little European cuties, um, I mean, they sting you once and they go off and die and, and then that's no harm, no foul. It was, it was you against the bee, right? Not like the Africanized killer bees, right? Those, if you see how they sting, 
they sting the same way. They're going to go off and die. But you don't get off that easy, do you? Because that one Africanized bee stings you. And guess what, ha guess what happens? The whole hive gets the message. And then pretty soon, you're like taking the one stinger out. And you turn around and you see the sun getting darkened over you as the entire hive is on its way after you. And then they basically gang up on you and sting you on mass, right? That's basically how those, so what they do is as they're stinging and we, they've actually studied this, what happens is the bees, which communicate with each other by vibration. And it's actually kind of cool because you can actually see them do that in their, in their hive when they're kind of trying to tell all the other worker bees, there's a great patch of clover leaf or whatever, just over here, turn to the left about a half a mile down, turn to the right and it's right on, you know, they're kind of like doing these like little wiggles, you know, it's like, you know, one little butt wiggle will be like turn left or, you know, something, a little turn this way will be like go north or something like that. So they're kind of like using vibrations of their body to sort of help them understand. It's like, listen, there's a good patch over here in this area. The same thing's happening when the killer bees are stinging you. They, the vibration that they put out is triggering and signaling the hive. We've got a bad guy here. Come out and kill him. And the entire hive comes after you, right? Uh, which is the reason why the Africanized bees are a little, a little uh, concerning, right? Number one is they're taking all of the resources from our honeybees, which we need for uh, pollination, right? Um, and then of course they're not very nice, so so you can't just ignore them, you know, live and let live kind of thing. Just leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. No, they're like, no, I don't think so. I don't like the way you look. I'm going to sting you, and my whole hive is coming for you. And then that's, so they're a little bit more aggressive that way. Um, so that's kind of the way neutrophils are, right? Because as they're dying, what's happening or they're attacking, they're going to start releasing the proteins and all the molecules that are bundled up in these cytoplasmic granules. And they're going to start releasing those to the system. And those molecules, a lot of them are signaling molecules calling for backup to the rest of the immune system. And then the rest of the immune system is going to be hearing these signals. Oh, Hey, we got a signal, an APB from the neutrophils. There's a bad guy over here. Let's go, right? Let's jump in the car and let's roll because we got some work to do. So that's basically what's happening with all these granulocytes. So here you can see how a neutrophil will move from the bloodstream. This is how a lot of these guys will move actually. They'll move from the bloodstream. Here they are in the bloodstream and then they'll kind of squeeze in between the cracks of the cells of oftentimes capillaries. And then they'll kind of pop into the connective tissue of the tissues and they'll patrol waiting for an invasion. Now eosinophils um, are bilobed, but they have kind of very, a lot of similarities to the neutrophils in that kind of bilobe where they got that little pucker in the middle. Um, these have a lot of granules in those granule in those uh, cytoplasmic granules, so large ones. They tend to are respond, they tend to respond to parasitic infections, and they also will uh, turn on when you have strong allergy, an allergy response. Okay, so both of them will actually turn on that case. Basophils are probably the rarest of all the white blood cells. These ones are the hardest ones to find. Um, and so these guys will typically be in connective tissue. Um, and they'll be along with another type of basophil, kind of a close relative of the basophils called the mast cell. Together, these two groups of cells will be responsible for releasing histamine, which is one of the molecules that's in their cytoplasmic granules. And this histamine basically is something that'll be released during allergic reactions. And what histamine does is basically it's a blood dilator. So it'll actually dilate your blood vessels. And the reason why you blood dilate that is it basically facilitates. The arrival of other white blood cells. Uh, the other thing it also does is it tends to constrict the bronchial passages in your lungs. Um, and so that creates that asthma attack. So generally speaking, whenever you have really bad allergies, you kind of start getting breathy and you'll take some sort of an inhaler with some sort of an antihistamine in it, perhaps, or you'll take a Claritin, which has sort of an antihistamine. And that's basically is reducing the effects of the histamine response. Because the idea is this. You know, the pollen, which is not dangerous, is not going to hurt you. But the mast cells and the basophil cells are seeing that as a danger. So they're creating a bunch of histamine. 
And then you're overriding that body response by saying, listen, I know more than you do. Pollen is not pathogenic. It's not going to kill me. So you don't need to be shutting down my airways because of a little bit of pollen. So you take an antihistamine to say, listen, back off, you know, back away from the crack pipe, relax, just, you know, don't go crazy here. You're overreacting, right? And that's what an antihistamine does. So those are your granulocytes. Notice all of them have the same commonality, right? Those cytoplasmic granules will be degranulated. That means they're gonna be released during the point of attack so they can signal other pieces of your immune system. Lymphocytes, which basically are coming in around a quarter to almost a third of your white blood cell complement, basically are broken down into two different types, B and T cell lymphocytes. B cells are so-called because they mature in the bone marrow. And these are the guys that produce the antibodies, uh, which will then mark a pathogen for destruction or will actually just destroy the pathogen itself. The other ones are called T cells. Um, these ones will actually do like cell to cell combat. So they'll actually go after individual cells. Okay. And you need both of them um, in order to actually have a functional immune system. And we'll talk more about the immune system in seven and eight. So the monocytes, the other of the eight granulocytes is the largest or the biggest of all the white blood cells. And so typically these are phagocytes that are patrolling throughout your bloodstream. Um, and then they'll develop into um, macrophages as they exit the bloodstream and go into the tissues. So they become macrophages and tissues. They are monocytes in the bloodstream. And so once they actually become macrophages, then they basically are phagocytic. So their job is really um, to just engulf pathogens, gobble them up, right? Um, and so they'll take up pathogens. They'll also be useful for old cells. Remember, we just got done saying that the red blood cells are taken out of circulation and recycled by macrophages. And so macrophages will recycle old red blood cells, right? That's our example there. And then, of course, debris. So from injury, so they'll gobble this up too. So they're not just phagocytic, they don't just gobble up bad guys, they also go clean up messes as well. As a matter of fact, a good, um, a good illustration of your blood cell breakdown and also happens to be like the debris cleanup strategy of, of macrophages. Anybody ever have a bruise? The correct answer to that is yes, right? If you've been alive in the, all, all, long enough on this planet, you've gotten a bruise or two. But bruises are cool, aren't they? They don't really feel cool initially, but they kind of look cool because they're like, you know, they kind of start off and they're kind of like a reddish color and then they kind of, they're kind of a bluish color and then they kind of turn bluish and then, and then they kind of start turning kind of a green color and then kind of a yellow color and then they kind of disappear. Right, they get kind of that that kind of greenish brown color starts to disappear, and it's mostly just a yellow spot, and then the yellow starts to slowly disappear, and then it's gone. The trajectory of that is actually mirrored by the red blood cell production and your macrophage's ability to clean up a mess. So, what's happened when you've gotten a bruise? What's happened is you've damaged some capillaries. Red blood cells have spewed all over your tissues. Remember, your circulatory system is a closed system. Your red blood cells are not supposed to be outside of those vessels. When they are outside of those vessels, it means you've damaged them and they're spilling all over your tissues, which is where they're not supposed to be. So originally you don't see a bruise. Why? Because your blood, which is spewing all of your connective tissue is largely oxygenated. But over time, what's gonna happen is those oxygens are gonna let go. And then it's going to be, become deoxygenated hemoglobin which is more of a bluish color, which is the reason why we get that blue red convention for arteries and veins is because deoxygenated blood is kind of a bluish color. It's not really blue. It's kind of more of like a, a dark maroon color, kind of a, a little bit of a purple in there, right? So that's kind of where that purplish color of the bruise gets to. But remember, this is basically hemoglobin and blood cells that are spilled all over your tissues. 
So while you're fixing your capillaries and sealing those back up, um, then you're, you got to clean the mess up. So who comes to clean the messes up? Macrophages. Macrophages come out there and they start gobbling up all these red blood cells. They start tearing them apart. They start tearing apart the heme. Now, remember, we just said that the heme byproduct is yellow. And that's what causes jaundice, right? That was just a few slides ago. But there's actually a step in between there. Because in reality, your heme, because of your iron, will be red at first. And then it'll be broken down by your macrophages into a byproduct called biliverdin. And so for those of you who know your Latin languages, verde is the root, the Latin root for what color? Green, right? Like mesa verde, right? That basically means green mesa. Um, or in French, it's ver, right? Erico ver is the word for green beans, right? So biliverdin is basically a green pigment, which is the reason why your bruises start to turn green as the macrophages are breaking down the heme that's been spilled all over your tissues. Then what happens is it converts this into bilirubin. Rubor, rubor is the Latin root for what color? So for this one, it's yellow, right? So yeah, there's a there's a crossover between ruber as redness and rub, the ruber of the ribbon for yellowness. But bilirubin is a yellowish pigment, right? Um, and so the this will then cause the yellowishness of the bruise itself. And then basically it's gone and you get normal colors. So that's what causes that, um, that kind of, um, that kind of uh, that kind of color, that color change, right? The rainbow effect, right? You go from kind of a red to more of a purplish deoxygenated to green to yellow, and then it cleans it up. So as it disappears, what that means is your macrophages are just slowly kind of cleaning it all up, getting rid of it all, and then basically putting it back into your bloodstream where you can excrete it out, okay? So, Sorry about that little trick question in there, right? Ruber and yellow. Uh, the ruber is referring to the redness of the blood, even though the bilirubin itself is yellow, yellowish. It's kind of a, it's kind of a reddish yellow, kind of an orangey. It's not like a true red, like this red. So that's why if you have a lot of that built up in your system, bilirubin, you turn jaundiced. It's a yellowish color. So. So um, then we're going to have different disorders, right? So that's basically how you, um, you basically go through a blood. So this is kind of a good example of a couple of things. First of all, two things. The blood breakdown process that macrophages do, plus also the cleanup process, right? Because that's what it's doing with the bruise. It's cleaning up the mess of uh, your hemorrhage. Now, the important thing about macrophages is since macrophages are also phagocytic, these guys are a little bit different, right? These guys kill like a wasp stings. How does a wasp sting? You ever been stung by a wasp? I will, by the way, sign up for getting stung by a wasp any day of the week over a bee. Because I've been stung by lots of wasps. And for the most part, they're irritating. They're hurt for a little bit. But man, when I'm stung by a bee, it's like the pain level is like several notches more. So how does a wasp sting? 
Well, if a wasp, so let's say this is a wasp abdomen. The stinger in a wasp is basically retractile. So instead of having like a little, like a little poison sac in here attached to it like a bee does, what it does, it has basically a little stinger that's inside the abdomen. And so when it stings, it basically kind of sticks it out like a little dart, but then it can retract it back in. And so if you watch a wasp closely, a lot of times, especially if they're in stress or if they think they're in stress, like a dying wasp, for instance, oftentimes you take a close look, it's very hard to see, they're very thin. But if you take a look at the stinger, you'll see they're like basically doing this, like that. They're like shooting their little stinger in and out like that because they're basically trying to take you down. They're like being like, okay, you're trying to kill me, so I'm going to go after you. I'm going to be like, like, it's like a knife, right? I'm just going to come after you. And it's just going in and out, in and out. And they can do that as many times as they want, right? So it's retractile that way. So they can sting many times and not be harmed because they don't lose any part of their body in the process of stinging. Um, and so this actually happened to me once when I was in California, um, unfortunately, in Sacramento, because I had a, I was cleaning out the garage, which has tons of black widows in it, which is like the garage is like a, a horror show for like dangerous insects. <laughs> black widows alone is enough to keep you out of the garage. But here I go. I'm, I'm in there. And then I noticed that there was a bunch of wasps in the windowsill in our garage. And of course I was like, okay, I, there's a nest here somewhere. I got to kill these guys. And that was my job. My job was to get rid of the wasp nests as they tried to, you know, form in our garage or elsewhere. And I was in my sweats and, um, and I, I killed the wasp. A couple of them I just angered, <laughs> but all of a sudden I felt the sensation of something crawling on my leg. And of course, you're killing wasps, right? So of course, it's like psychological. You're thinking, okay, you're, you're just messing with your own head. It's not, you're just, because you're killing wasps, it's, you're freaking yourself out. But it was so compelling <laughs> that I actually started feeling it going up my leg. And I literally, and of course, I had like black sweats on and I had like a hole in the knee. Um, and so I literally like ripped my sweats off and like ran into the house. I'd never taken my sweats off so quickly. But as I looked at my leg, what I noticed were like little welts that went all the way down my leg. And so when I went to go check out my sweats, I found a wasp and my sweats. Not one, but three different wasps in my sweats. So I must've hacked them off because they all came after me. They found my weak spot in my little hole and then they came after me. And not only that, but as I ripped my sweats down, I could, you could see how they were shooting at me, stinging me all the way down as I was ripping my sweats off and they were dragging against my skin, stinging me all the way down. And they were fine, they were happy until I got a hold of them. Um, but, but that was my first lesson in Oh, okay. So you guys don't just die after you sting me. You come back for more. Right. So um, that was uh, that was my introduction to um, to wasps, right? Uh, which is kind of funny because you think of Muhammad Ali's famous line, right? Float like a butterfly, sting like a no, he didn't really sting like a bee. Because if he's done like a bee, George Foreman would have laid him out in the first punch, right? Muhammad Ali would have thrown the first punch at George Foreman and he would have died. He'd be like, oh, too much. I'm done, right? That's stinging like a bee. Muhammad Ali stung like a wasp, right? You could wail on him and he's coming back for you, right? And he doesn't go away and he just keeps coming and keeps coming. And that's the way wasps are. Yeah, that's true, right? The rest of it. Yeah, that's unfortunate, but that's so, I mean, I mean, it's just, yeah, you're right. The whole effect, you got to take it on the whole effect, but it's a good thing he didn't sting like a bee because he wouldn't have been the great champ that he was if he did. <laughs> yeah, he didn't really care about an actual wasp or a bee. He just, 
he uh, he wanted to mess with his opponent's head, which is he was actually pretty good at that. Yeah, my favorite is the Thrilla in Manila, right? That's uh, that's um, a lot of good Muhammad Ali isms, right? So a lot of good ones there. By the way, you know, wasps are unlike um, worse than bees because bees are fairly passive. For the most part, they'll leave you alone. Wasps will get angry at you and they'll come after you. Um, which I also, when I was doing this wasp duty, I got stuck with that one probably because I was a teenager and didn't have anything better to do. So, hey, let's just send Mark out there to go kill all the wasps. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, the one trick that I noticed was um, unlike bees, wasps know better. They know how to pick and choose their fights because I figured out early on how to back a wasp away is uh, when they see you coming after them, they tend not to come after you. And that's happened to me many, many times, especially like when I was going after their nest, they would come after me. What they're trying to do is get you to run to chase you off. But I would get stung and then I'd get angry and then I would basically chase after them. And there's actually several times when I've seen wasps coming after me and I'm coming after them with like, you know, like a can of spray or like a tennis rack or something like that. Or, I mean, they, they just turn right back around and they start, they started running away from me. It happens all the time. The only ones that doesn't happen are the guards, the Queens guards. Um, Cause I did this actually once a few years ago, we had a wasp nest under our sighting. And uh, it got to the point where the guards came out and these guys were not going to run away. It was like, save the queen. They were coming for me. And both of them were like doing the little fox thing. So I couldn't take them both out. And they were, I mean, they were working together. They were like, here, I'll get them to swing after me. And then you come in and you nail them. And so it was, that was like, okay, fine. You got the message. I got the message. Let's call it a truce. Let the queen live. And then we're good. By the way, I never killed the queen, but I did see her. It was really cool. It was like in the fall, about this time of year, actually, I was just out there and I saw her actually come out from underneath. It was like her time to go. And I could tell she's a queen because she's big old, big old fat thing. And there was a part of me that was like, gotcha, right? But then I stopped and I'm like, no, you go on, you go on. You've had a good season, you go ahead. And I just let her fly away. And um, see, even, even I have my limits, right? I mean, that was the queen, she did a good job. Um, I had respect for her, right? Which is kind of crazy, I guess, in a way. Most people are like, kill it! It's like, but you know, this is kind of like, it was like an all summer battle. It was like uh, just back and forth and back and forth. It was just like, and at this point it was kind of like, we were just both like, I've won a few, you've won a few. And we're kind of like shook hands and said like, good game, go ahead. Go fly and do whatever queens do in the fall. Um, don't know, but whatever. But that was cool. So, <clears throat> by the way, just to let you guys know, I'm not a cold-hearted killer. I'm, I'm sure that makes you pleased to hear that, right? I don't just kill for sport. I don't actually like killing things. Actually, my view on wasps are considerably different because our garden, or actually our front yard is full of flowers and there's flowers everywhere. It's like we're slowly replacing our lawn with flowers and grass and pollinators. And we've got like wasps all over the place. Um, I mean, everywhere. I mean, they're bumping into me, they're landing on me. But you know what's kind of cool is not a single one of them has actually been aggressive. And I've actually been in the middle of all of them. They love all the flowers that we love. And like, they're like lining, they're bumping into my head and they're just, they're just hanging out and they're not doing anything whatsoever. It's almost like, like over the last few years, we've been intentional about trying to plant things to support life. Like we've been planting things for hummingbirds to bring hummingbirds to the garden. We've been planting things for butterflies to bring butterflies to the garden and pollinators to bring the pollinators to the garden. So anything that's alive and living, we've been intentionally trying to add things to the garden to bring 
living things to the garden. And uh, the one thing we remarked actually this, because it was unusual, because usually you kind of get to them, it's a little scary because they're like, oh, all these wasps, they're going to extinct me. But this year has been really different. And we kind of made the mention, it's like, it almost seems like they know. Like they know that we're trying to take care of them and that we're not a threat. Because normally they come after you, right? You get close to their food source and they would start coming after you. But we get into their food source and they're just like buzzing around, they're just hanging out. You know, some of them will light on me, they'll just crawl on me. I'll kind of shoo them away because I don't want them to accidentally sting me. <laughs> but, but, you know, they're just, they're hanging out and we're in the middle of, like there's one time when I was actually in the middle of the garden and they were just, they were all around me, all, of, all around me on the flowers. And it's like, no aggression whatsoever. It was like, it's weird. It's almost like they know that we're trying to feed them and take care of them. And it's like, we're part of their family. And so it's different. So that's replaced by stone cold killer. All right. So I just say that to let you guys know that there is hope. <laughs> right. Okay. So let's take a look at some of the disorders, right? So basically some disorders of white blood cells that we see. Um, uh, um, severe combined immunodeficiency, a disease. So SCIDS is basically an inherited disease where your lymphocytes won't develop normally. And so that's a big chunk of your immune system that's basically non-functional. Leukemia is a type of cancer where your white blood cells will proliferate without control. And I know you're thinking, you're thinking, well, wait, isn't that a good thing? I mean, white blood cells are helpful, right? They're our immune system, so more the merrier, right? Well, the problem is when they develop out of control, they tend to be abnormal, not normal. So it's kind of like having an abnormal type of a white blood cell, which then starts to protrude and sort of impinge on the normal function of the regular white blood cells. So basically it sort of hinders normal function. of your normal white blood cells. Infectious mononucleus basically is caused by Epstein-Barr virus. And so it basically will infect your lymphocytes and this will, um, it's kind of a viral infection. We'll talk more about that in a few chapters here, but this will kind of lead to kind of uh, an ongoing fatigue, sore throat, swollen lymph nodes, things like that. So if you kind of have persistent flu-like symptoms that sort of persist then they'll get checked for mono. Um, and that's oftentimes what's causing it. Now let's take a look at platelets and blood clotting. We'll talk more about the role of white blood cells and the functionality in the immune chapters that are coming up here. But let's go ahead and take a look at the platelets. So the platelets basically are what's called thrombocytes. They're not actually cells. What they are basically are fragments, chunks, essentially of a larger cell called a megakaryocyte. This basically is the white blood cell. And so this is made in your red bone marrow. And so you basically break off these little chunks, these little pieces that are sticky. And they kind of circulate throughout your system. So roughly you're making uh, several hundred billion platelets are made per day. So you have a lot of platelets that are constantly cycling through your system. And their job is simple, blood clotting or coagulation. So have you ever cut yourself and you kind of stop the bleeding? but you just kind of wait for a few minutes and the bleeding will just kind of stop. That's blood clotting that's happening. So those platelets are recognizing the breach in the system. And then what they're doing is they're coming in and they're plugging the hole to keep your blood from basically spilling out. That's your coagulation. That's what blood clotting is. So it's been typically driven by um, several different types of proteins. At the end point is uh, fibrinogen. So that is a main uh, protein that's associated with blood clotting and it's stimulated by a hormone called prothrombin. So plasma proteins, prothrombin, will basically lead to ultimately the activation of fibrinogen, which will then be involved in blood clotting. Vitamin K is necessary for the formation of the prothrombin, which is necessary for the activation of fibrinogen. So you can see it's kind of like a big cascade when you're taking a look at your blood clotting system. Uh, vitamin K, by the way, you can get a lot of vitamin K in uh, bananas. Okay, so that's good for blood clotting purposes. So let's go ahead and take a look at blood clotting itself. 
So you have to clot your blood. Why? Because when you breach your blood vessel, your blood is going to be filling and spilling out and you don't want to lose your formed elements. So essentially you don't leak all of your formed elements out of your blood vessels. Otherwise you're going to be in a whole world of trouble. Okay. So you got to stop the hemorrhage. Now there are 13 different things involved in blood clotting. We call them clotting factors. Some are hereditary, some are not. For instance, calcium is a type of clotting factor. There are different types of proteins that are clotting factors that are all necessary to clot your blood or for your blood to normally coagulate. Normally speaking, what happens when your vessel breaks, and by the way, this isn't just the ones you know about, right? This isn't just like when you cut your skin and you bleed, that's the obvious one. You're also oftentimes, you, like a bruise for instance, is one where your skin doesn't actually breach. So you're not actually breaking the skin, but you are breaking capillaries under your skin. And those are blood vessel ruptures that require blood clotting. So there's a lot of ruptures of your blood vessel that you're not even aware of half the time that have to constantly be clotted and then repaired. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of going on there. So what happens is after your blood vessel breaks, the first thing that happens is your platelets will start to clump up at that breakage point to basically seal it up, plugging the hole essentially. to prevent more blood from spilling out. So then once this happens, the platelets and the tissues that are injured will start to release clotting factors, in this case called prothrombin activator, which might suggest activates prothrombin, which will activate fibrinogen. So you can see how there's a cascade, a multi-step cascade. A leads to B, leads to C, leads to D, right? So prothrombin activator will basically convert prothrombin into thrombin, which will then go and activate fibrinogen. This requires calcium ions. So if you don't have calcium in your system, it's going to be difficult for your blood to clot normally. Okay. There's a lot of reasons to have um, calcium. Obviously, it's going to be a major component of your bone. Um, and of course, it's necessary for muscle contraction, but it's also necessary for blood clotting. So there's a lot of important things in your body that require calcium. So uh, go take your favorite calcium supplement. Make sure you're well rigged on calcium. So then once you basically activate your thrombin, this is gonna be the enzyme that's gonna basically convert your fibrinogen into fibrin. And a fibrin is kind of like basically a fibrous protein network that creates a sort of a gauze-like framework of protein fibers that essentially acts like rebar in cement. It'll basically um, take the soft, which is kind of a, almost like a soft chewing gum, like of a, a sticky plug, of a platelet plug, and it's gonna inject rigidity and strength into that soft platelet plug. And then this will create the hard fibrin clot, which is temporary, but basically it'll be that clot. So success, you've plugged the hole. Now then, after you plug the hole, you have to basically take the clot away. You can't have the clot stay, stay in there forever. So once you actually fix the tissue underneath the clot, then like a scab example is an exterior clot. That's an exterior blood clot. Notice what's happening underneath the scab. Underneath the scab, you have basically your tissues reconstituting themselves. You're basically healing up your tissues. You're, make, you're kind of laying them back down so that they're normal again. And then at some point, you have to get rid of that clot and the enzyme that does that, that destroys fibrin is what's called plasmin. And so once plasmin destroys this fibrin network, then you'll have the removal of the clot and you'll have normal tissue underneath to basically resume its activities. So then, um, oftentimes from a clot, you'll have serum, that's that straw colored plasma-like fluid coming out of it, right? So like when you have an oozy scab, um, that's basically serum coming out of it. And so it has everything that plasma has with the exception of fibrinogen and prothrombin. So that basically, that kind of straw colored sticky ooze, like an oozing sore, is basically your plasma, your blood plasma. And so this is kind of what it looks like.
Okay. Hold on. Looks like PowerPoint is freezing up on me here. There we go. So here's your original breach here. And then once you basically get that breach, notice your platelets are gonna basically glom on here and they're gonna stick, they're sticky. So they stick to each other and they create what's called a platelet plug. Then once that's formed, you're going to stimulate your prothrombin activator with calcium to convert prothrombin into thrombin, which then will activate fibrinogen into fibrin threads, again, with calcium. And now you can see you've got these fibrin threads, which are interwoven in between this platelet plug, creating a hard plug or a hard clot. And that will basically stop the bleeding. That's what's happening when you coagulate. So if you're wondering how much time this takes, well, how much time does it take for your wound to stop bleeding? Depends on how deep it is, right? How big the breach is, but not very long couple of minutes, maybe, right? Um, it depends on, of course, how big that is, how big the platelet has to, how platelet plug has to be, but it can happen quite quickly. This is actually a real micrograph of red blood cells that have been trapped in this fibrin mesh. So you can see these are basically the fibrin threads. It's almost like fish caught in a net, right? So you got platelets in there, you've got red blood cells in there. It's got this big gamish, big wad of stuff that's in there and it's plugging up this hole. Okay. And so that's basically your blood clotting. So now what are some of the disorders of blood clotting? Well, we have uh, thrombocytopenia, which basically means you have too few platelets. Um, if you're not making enough in your bone marrow due to maybe um, an aberration in the hormone that's required to signal that production process, perhaps, um, or if you have abnormal breakdown um, outside of the bone marrow, whatever, um, it's going to have too few platelets. It can be caused by leukemia because of that abnormality and where you're not making enough platelets because you're making all these abnormal uh, cells instead. Or certain drugs can also cause the breakdown of platelets. And so you get this sort of deficiency of platelets. And so what, can, what uh, this causes is basically excessive bleeding. So you're not going to be able to clot normally and you, and you could potentially bleed um, to death by just minor things. Um, this can also lead clotting to thromboembolism, right? So basically you have a thrombus, which is essentially a stationary clot um, that's kind of in place. Um, and so if it's traveling, it's called an embolism. And if it's a thromboembolism, it's basically a traveling clot or an embolism that stops or gets lodged in a vessel somewhere. And that can cause uh, aberrations of blood delivery. Another thing that we see in terms of clotting deficiencies are hemophilias A and B. Um, von Willebrand syndrome is another one. And so this one's a genetic disorder, but this is basically where you're unable to form um, blood clots. So hemophilia is basically hemo means blood, philia means love, blood lover. So this is essentially when you're missing some sort of a clot of a, some sort of a clotting factor. So remember there's 13 clotting factors. Typically speaking, if you're missing any one of those, you're gonna create a hemophilic um, sort of type of a scenario. And so different types of hemophilia will be associated with different, uh, different missing factors, okay? So that's the reason why you have hemophilia A and hemophilia B, where you're basically missing a factor, so you're not able to clot normally, unable to form those clots. And so um, that, that's a problem, right? So this can, uh, this can cause, again, bleeding out. That's the reason why hemophiliacs are called blood lovers, hemo, blood, philia, uh, lover is because you basically love to bleed, right? So it's, that's, that's basically how we describe the, the blood disorder is that you just love to bleed. Where everybody else is coagulating and stopping the bleeding, hemophiliacs will continue to bleed. So uh, that's kind of, and typically what will happen is they'll oftentimes bleed to death for very minor things, right? So if you have a deficiency in blood clotting, then you could die of just simple things like a nosebleed. 
Right? Matter of fact, um, when we had heart patients who were on blood thinners, it wasn't quite like a hemophilia sort of a thing, but it was reducing blood clotting. So you don't basically get blood clotting on your stent, right? So if you had too much blood thinner, kind of like a hemophilic type of a scenario, literally we had patients that were in the emergency room and they were there for a bloody nose. And it was like dangerous because it was hours and hours and they were packing the nose like with all kinds of gauze to try to get the bleeding to stop and they couldn't get it to stop. I mean, it was, it was, um, it can be a dangerous thing. Okay. So let's take a look at the blood types. So when you take a look at the different blood types, this is uh, something that we ran across uh, in, in clinical practice, right? So you have basic different types of blood types. And the reason you have this is because of a certain type of protein that you're going to have on the surface of red blood cells. Remember, that all cells have a type of protein called a glycoprotein. And the important thing to understand is that glycoproteins, glycocarbohydrate protein, it's kind of a cell membrane protein that has like this little carbohydrate branch on it, like that. It's like a glycoprotein. Glycoproteins are important in cell biology because they allow cells to identify each other. So your liver cells, for instance, will have a profile of glycoproteins that are like a barcode that tells you I'm a liver, right? Your neurons will have a different glycoprotein mixture that tells them that they are nerve cells. And skin cells will have a different glycoprotein matrix. So it's kind of like your profile, right? It's kind of like your barcode as a cell type. And this is how it's used. Most glycoproteins, and there's many, many, many glycoproteins in your average cell membrane are completely harmless. However, there are two groups that cause problems. And that's the reason why we have to follow them with blood typing. So basically what you have are glycoproteins on the surface of your red blood cells, in this particular case, a very specific type of glycoprotein who, who will, that will basically create an immune response. And that's the reason why we have to follow them. So for instance, we found this out by doing blood transfusions. Matter of fact, when we uh, fought the civil war, we for the first time had the need and had the capacity to do blood transfusions. The problem is what we noticed was that your chances of surviving a blood transfusion were kind of like 50-50. And we didn't really know why, right? But as it turns out, as we sort of learned, we realized that there were different blood types and they're not all compatible with each other. And so that's basically what we learned. Now, when we're looking for compatibility, we need to make sure that two blood types that are mixed together do not do what's called agglutination. This is clumping of the blood cells. So they basically coagulate together and they clump together. Um, and that's what the red blood cells will do. So if you take two blood types and you mix them together and there's no clumping, those two are compatible with each other. Okay. And that's kind of how they did it back in the 19th century. They didn't know anything about A type, B type, AB and that sort of stuff. They just took, you know, you know, Gomer's blood and Cletus's blood. They mixed it together. And if it didn't clump, they're like, go ahead, transfuse. Right. That's the way they did it back in those days. Okay. So we have our blood groups, right, which basically form what's called an antigen. And an antigen is essentially some sort of a molecule, anything that will basically stimulate an immune response, literally anything that will stimulate a immune response. It can be a protein. It could be anything. It could be actually a non-biological molecule. But this breaks us into our blood types. First of all, we have type A, type B, AB, and then O. The type A blood will create an A-type antigen. That is to say a specific form of the glycoprotein that will be the A type. A B type person will create a B type antigen where they'll have a different type of a glycoprotein on it, right? A different carbohydrate on it. So that'll be the B type. An AB person produces both and an O person produces neither. So it's kind of what it looks like in pictures. So you can imagine in an A type person, they've got these basic A type antigens out here that are essentially the type of glycoprotein that is specific to that particular antigen. As a result, their immune system basically will make antibodies against what it doesn't know. And in this case, if you're an A-type person, you grow up with red blood cells with the A-type form on it. So that you know, you grow up knowing that, but B-type is foreign to you. And as a result, you make antibodies against it. That's the reason why you're making anti-B 
antibodies in an A-type person. A B-type person has the B-type antigen, a different form of the carbohydrate. And so the thing that they don't know is the A-type. So that's foreign to them. So they make anti-A antibodies. Now, the AB person knows both because they have both A and B. So their immune system doesn't make antibodies against either because they know both of them. They're both known to their immune system. Nothing scary there. And an O-type person doesn't have A or B on their surface. So for them, the A-type antigen and the B-type antigen are unknown and scary. So what they do, they make both anti-A antibodies and anti-B antibodies. So what does this mean? This mean that everybody with A-type blood will make anti-B antibodies. B-type blood will make antibodies against A. The AB people will make neither because they know both, right? They're familiar with both of them. And the O-type person will make both antibodies, A and B. Now, what do these antibodies do? What these antibodies do when they're in the presence of their antigen is they bind only to the antigen that they're made for. This is actually how we do blood typing. So when you have compatibility, the idea is you can't receive blood from another person that doesn't have your antigen. So for instance, an A-type person can't receive blood from a B-type person. Why? Because their immune system will go after B. It's foreign to them. They can't get, take blood from an AB person either because their immune system will attack the B piece of the AB person. A B type person can't receive it from A because they'll attack the A because their body doesn't know what A is. And they'll also attack the A type piece and the AB person. The O type person, for them, it looks all scary. The A person, scary. The B person, scary. The AB person, double scary. So all they can get is O type blood. So because O doesn't have anything scary, they're able to give blood to an AB person. They're also able to give blood to the B type person, and they're able to give blood to the O type person, or into the A person. So as a result, these individuals are referred to as universal donors. O types, we love you because you're gonna save us all, right? Now, the AB types can take it from everybody, right? If you take a look at the AB, the AB has A and B, right? So first of all, we already said that it can take it from O, no problem there, right? But what about A, can it, can it take it from A? Sure it can, because it's got A on there. So A is good. Can it take it from B? Yeah, because it's got B on there. So it can take it from B too. So an AB person can take it from AB, that makes sense. Can take it from an A, can take it from a B, can take it from an O. So as a result, these guys are the universal recipients. So an AB person, you need blood, just walk in there and say, listen, line me up, take it all. Just take it off the shelf, don't worry about it, just line me up, right? An O type person, a little trickier. They can't take it from anybody but another O. But they can give it everybody, which is one of the reasons why Bonfies loves you O-types, because you can give it to anybody, okay? So this is basically what happens when you have the blood compatibility. So this is the way we do blood typing. First of all, let's take a look at it. So we're gonna take our blood type. So here's a blood type from a person with A-type blood. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically put it together with antibodies against uh, the different types, right? So in this case, we're gonna use an anti-B antibody. So when these two are together, notice there is no correct, there's no match here, right? These guys are not going to bind or recognize the antigen because it's an A antigen against a B antibody. So there's no binding and therefore no agglutination, no clumping. So the blood is gonna look smooth. 
Now, when you have the A-type person and you put it with the A-type antibody, now all of a sudden the antibody sees its antigen. It binds. And as it binds, notice it's going to clump up the blood cells. So now you're going to get agglutination. Or clumping. And here it looks chunky. Kind of like curdled milk. It'll start to glum up to each other, right? They'll kind of start to form these little globular balls and clumps. So that tells you you've got A type blood, right? That tells you what your blood is. If you're trying to blood type it, you're basically saying, oh, okay. The antibody just basically told me there's A there because A basically it will produce the agglutination in this particular case. Same thing you could do for B type blood or AB blood to figure out who's there. Like if, an a, if it's an AB, you would expect to see agglutination with the A antibody and with the B antibody, right? So that clumping is a positive for what's there. It's telling you what's there, okay? Now there's another piece of your blood group, right? Because you're not just A or B, you're A or B positive or negative. Right, so that gets us to our RH group. Our RH group is RH factor. It's another glycoprotein. And in this particular case, what's gonna happen is you basically either have it or you don't. So you either have it, in which case you're RH positive or you don't, in which case you're RH negative. And so this basically um, is something that happens. So you don't have these automatically. You have to actually be exposed to these first before you make them. And so if you're RH negative, um, then your body doesn't know what this protein looks like. So if you get RH positive blood, you're gonna make antibodies against that because it looks foreign to you and you're gonna go attack that. So this is a good example of the idea of how the immune system works. The immune system only attacks self versus non-self. Not good versus bad. Here's a good example. Hemolytic disease of the newborn. This is essentially when a woman who is Rh negative, so her red blood cells don't have the Rh factor on it, has a baby who is Rh positive. So what happens is the baby's red blood cells start to mix with the mother's and the mother sees it as foreign and starts to make anti-Rh antibodies against it. Normally, what happens is that baby makes it but the second baby who happens to be RH positive is gonna be waiting for a mother's immune system who's already primed with RH antibodies. And so in that particular case, those antibodies are gonna cross the placenta and it's gonna attack that second fetus's red blood cells. And it's gonna create an anemia and lots of uh, issues. And so typically speaking, what has to happen is when you get your blood test and you do your pregnancy screening, is a lot of times what they'll do is they notice that you have uh, an RH negative mother with an RH positive baby is they will basically give you Rogam, um, which is kind of an anti RH antibody shot that basically kind of quells that immune response and keeps the mother's immune system from attacking your own baby. This is basically what it looks like. So here you can see the baby's red blood cells will leak into the mother's system and that will trigger the immune response and cause her to make the RH neg the RH antibodies. When the second baby comes around, because her system has been primed for this event, she's ready for it now. So the second baby then, the antibodies are there and they'll basically start to cross the placenta. They'll notice and recognize these foreign antigens on there and they'll start to attack the baby's red blood cells. Okay. Unless you put Rogam in there, which basically reduces that activity. So it kind of mutes or dampens a little bit that immune response. Okay, so in the last five minutes or so, um, I just kind of want to finish up with a little bit of kind of wrap up of this particular chapter. We'll get chapter seven started on Wednesday. So let's take a look at homeostasis, right? So basically we've already seen a lot of it going on. So how does your uh, blood system, obviously your cardiovascular system is blood is part of the cardiovascular system, your digestive system. Basically your blood vessels are delivering nutrients. So that's basically that's intersecting with your digestive system, your urinary, urinary system. Blood vessels are basically the ones transporting waste. Um, and so that's basically how it's interacting with your urinary system and your muscular system. This is what's keeping your muscles contracting. 
delivering the nutrients and the oxygen to your muscles so that you can contract. Um, by way of that, you also have contraction and nervous stimulation of your blood vessels, their contraction and their constriction and dilation, which basically regulates blood pressure. In your endocrine system, you also have hormones that will actually affect also blood pressure through dilation and constriction of your blood vessels. The blood is carrying oxygen, which automatically ties it to your respiratory system, right? And of course, your lymphatic system, where you have your lymphatic capillaries, who are basically mopping up all that excess fluid that you don't mop up when you go through your capillaries, that little bit of leftover fluid in your tissues. That's what your lymphatic system is mopping up, along with the transport of your um, immune cells as well. Of course, your skeletal system, which is basically the source of calcium necessary for blood clotting as well as, of course, the bone marrow, which is gonna be producing all of your blood cells. So you can see how now what you have is really not a bunch of systems that are working in isolation. What you rather have is a bunch of systems that are highly integrated with each other, where oftentimes you don't really know when you leave one system and enter the next, okay? And that's kind of where we get our homeostasis, for instance. Uh, this is kind of like the blab slides for the picture. That's why I wanna go through these quickly because um, you kind of get it all with that little image there. Right, your cardiovascular and your lymphatic. So basically, your interstitial uh, fluid is communicating with your blood plasma. That's basically the source of all nutrients and things of that nature. Your lymph is basically picking up and carrying um, all of that excess water and returning all of that to your cardiovascular system for redelivery. Your respiratory system, basically, you're transporting oxygen and CO2 throughout your uh, body and you're delivering that to your respiratory system to be expelled or to be taken in. Your digestive system, you're taking in nutrients um, that will then feed the cells that you're delivering oxygen to. Also, you're picking up metabolic waste as well and delivering it to your excretory organs. So this is basically where your um, urinary system comes into play. Of course, um, you have contractions. So this is your muscular system. So basically contractions require um, blood circulation. You need nutrients for that. So you need oxygen and nutrients in order to get normal um, contraction. So this is all borne by your blood. And you also um, need your contraction to move your blood, right? So basically you need this to essentially create that cardiovascular venous blood return and lymph return. So you can see how one helps the other and the other helps. It's like I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Right. I'll give you nutrients and oxygen so that you can contract. And when you contract, you can help me return my blood back to the heart so that I can get more nutrients and oxygen to feed to you so that you can contract and actually get me back to the heart. So you can see how there's like this very much sort of I scratch your back, you scratch mine sort of a scenario when we're taking a look at physiology. Um, the red bone marrow is going to be producing your red blood cells. So this is its link to the skeletal system. Also, it's just the storehouse for your calcium ions, which is required for blood clotting. And then of course, in your endocrine system, your red blood cell production is gonna be under the control of your endocrine system as well as calcium release. So you don't just release calcium for kicks and grins, it's actually under the tight control of your endocrine system, which is tying your blood system to your, um, to your endocrine system, which is a regulatory system that helps regulate things. And then of course your urinary system, basically where you're balancing acid, base and water salt through the production of urine, but you're also regulating um, cell production through erythropoietin secretion um, through your kidneys as well. So not only are you screening the blood and getting rid of the waste that your blood has been picking up this entire time, but you're also stimulating red blood cell production and the formation of red blood cells in the formed elements to increase the red blood cell count in your blood by way of a hormone that's being secreted by the kidneys themselves. So you can see how you have these uh, contact points and these cross communication points between multiple systems. And so that basically shows you how everything is integrated together. Okay, so that will be the end of that chapter. And so we will begin chapter seven on Wednesday.